Now, buried behind me are six men who were executed for being members of the 1st Georgia State Volunteers, a Unionist regiment mustered into service in late October 1864. So if you were a Unionist, you had established lines, and if you were a Unionist, for example, in North Georgia, you could make your way through the valleys and up the creeks into East Tennessee and just muster into service there. However, the men who joined in Georgia, their battalion was only 400 strong, were afforded very ill treatment and often quickly executed. But the the presence of these great bands of Unionists up in the Appalachia Mountains is indicative of something greater. Basically, the Confederate government was very authoritarian. They demanded a high tax rate, and when you couldn't get it, they would go and raid your house and requisition what they needed to feed troops in the local area. And this caused very ill feelings among many people in Appalachia who were living hand to mouth. Of course, most of them joined earlier in the war in Tennessee, but men like the ones who were executed and buried behind me joined only when the Union was knocking on their front door because they had their families to feed. And here you have the executed First Georgia State Troop volunteers. All men from Georgia, all men who joined the Union. Uh, there's someone else in the cemetery buried that I'd like to show you who actually wrote about the rebels in North Georgia, who were mainly, at that point, they were doing rearguard actions. He wrote about them because of the negative reputation they'd received after the war, and certainly growing up, even in Georgia history, they never talked about these men. Sergeant Sion Darnell actually wrote a little bit about the first Georgia state volunteers after the Civil War was over and became kind of a public mouthpiece for them. They were called the Forgotten Band of Guerrillas. And so he kind of came to their cause and wrote a little bit about them. He, like I said in the other video, joined a Tennessee regiment in late 1864 and came to know the Georgia Unionists quite well. A new sign in front of the old Dawsonville Courthouse is finally commemorating Georgia Unionists in the Civil War. After federal troops entered the state in 1864, a volunteer infantry battalion, also known as the 1st Georgia State Troop Volunteers, was created. The reason why so many people, black and white alike, joined this unit is because, one, they wanted pay that was more stable, and two, the Confederate government was very authoritarian and they demanded high taxation. Now, this didn't fly in remote parts of rural North Georgia. In fact, a lot of resistance to the Confederacy came from the poorest areas of Appalachia, areas like eastern Tennessee, Mississippi, central northern Alabama, and this unit was very ephemeral. It was mustered out of service at this courthouse in 1865. In the main cemetery overlooking downtown Dahlonega is the empty grave of Eiley Stewart, who, along with two of his friends on October 22nd, 1864, was taken out of town and summarily shot without any trial. And this was a forgotten war crime, and furthermore, testament to the fact that there was a civil war operating within the normal civil war. There was talk of organizing a force of Confederate Home Guard that would come up to Dahlonega and root these people out. So in January 1863, the son of famed Robert E. Lee, who was himself a colonel, sent out a dispatch of about 500 Confederate Home Guard, and they rampaged through the countryside. So when they caught these three men in a group of eight, the rest escaped, they brought them to the county jail. It's now the Gold Museum of Dahlonega, and they chained them up in the basement but the judge wasn't in town. It was a remote region of North Georgia, so he was actually out on a circuit. They were just taken out and summarily shot. Three men who were uniformed members of the Tennessee Mountain Cavalry. These were actual soldiers, and any trial would have revealed this. Eile Stewart and the two men who were executed alongside him were born up here in North Georgia and at the time were taking volunteer positions at cavalry camps around Athens, Tennessee, which was controlled by the Union. Now, when they were let out, they were not told what was going to happen, but they must have figured it out pretty soon because they blindfolded them, tied them together, put them on the back of a horse, and brought them down here to Soldier's Path. And this is actually quite a distance away from the main courthouse where they were held, so they must have realized as they headed out into the hills what awaited them. And it's said that their bodies are still buried out here. The only victim of the Bearden's Bridge Massacre, whose family actually decided to memorialize him with his own tombstone, albeit empty because the bodies are still buried in a mass grave up on Bearden's Bridge, was Private Solomon Stanley, and it reflected that he was attempting to join the 5th Tennessee Infantry Division. And behind him is another veteran of Fannin County, another poor farmer named Jephthah Hawkins, who lived to be 
80 something years old and it kind of shows the nature of the poor farmers in this county pledging allegiance to America more so than the Confederacy. They did find on them a list of sympathetic Georgia men who wanted to join the first Georgia volunteers. And these are the six graves that you now see in Marietta National Cemetery. And you can actually see that Eileen T. Stewart, who was part of the 5th Tennessee Mounted Infantry, someone has come along and removed the Confederate flag from his grave. I've come out to the Oak Grove Cemetery in Lunar, also in Union County, to tell a little bit about Peter Parrish and the sole survivor of the Madden Branch Massacre. See, at this point in the war, farmers in North Georgia, who were already incredibly poor, had a lot of ideas about going and joining the Union, because everybody could kind of see the writing on the wall. And Peter Parrish got seven friends together from the adjacent counties bordering Tennessee. Most of them, if not all of them, had actually defected from the Confederate military earlier on in the war, and they decided to make their way up to Tennessee. But there was a man named Gatewood who was apparently incredibly tall, had very long hair and a red beard. They called him a fiend, a villain, and he captured six of these eight men after a short firefight, lined them up, and executed all of them. The only reason we know the story is because Peter Paris decided to actually take it to the press. And because of this, we know the story of the Gatewood Massacre, which is still not talked about very often when it comes to tales of the Deep South and the Civil War. And I would have liked to see Peter Paris's original grave, because apparently the new one has some discrepancies in the dates of birth. In the same cemetery, you have the grave of Daniel Davenport, another Union volunteer, a poor farmer from Georgia, and he actually had the courage to write on his grave, it's not much visible anymore. His tales are past, his work is done, he fought the fight, the victory won. And Paris's grave is right up here near the church. We have here before us on the Georgia side of the Georgia-Tennessee state line, the grave of Lewis Brady, who was impressed into Confederate service, drafted several times, and he went AWOL every time, so the Confederate military put him in prison in Vicksburg for desertion. Well, when the Union Army laid siege to the city, they broke into the jail and freed the prisoners who'd gone AWOL, and initially he signed a document promising to not take arms up against the United States, and eventually he would hide out in the local area. He made his way back down because they figured that he was a Union sympathizer. But braving the partisans that were active with the Confederacy, men like Gatewood, he managed to, after living in a cave for some time in the local community, go and join the Union Army himself and thus began a colorful career for several years as a partisan and raider on the Union side of things. You've got a early pioneer cemetery that runs adjacent to the more modern cemetery up the hill. And it's interesting, if you take a look, you can see how well divided these communities were. After all, there are Confederate graves right here, proudly still displaying the Confederate flag, and a couple more over here as well. And you can nearly imagine the blood feuding that was going on. You've got the Brady family, which were Unionists over there, and the Anderson family right here, many of which served in the Confederacy. Of course, you've got Isaac Anderson. You've got many Andersons that died more recently. Isaac Anderson's, I believe, either brother or son, who's buried over here, who served in the Army and the Infantry. And several more Confederate tombstones behind me. And this is an interesting grave from the Doughty family, of which many members joined the Confederacy. On the backside, from his original tombstone, you can see the bottom line. It's very hard to make out, but it says, A true, spelled with a W, E-W, Republic. We're back here in Union County on the Tennessee-Georgia state line to talk a little bit about some of the Union sympathizers here in the south of Appalachia. Buried here before me, I believe these two brothers were Union veterans. Both died during the war. And you've got Wesley Walker, who was killed at Cumberland Gap late in the war, and his brother, Peter Walker, who was killed at a creek battle or a creek skirmish in a place called Bull Run Creek in eastern Tennessee. And this kind of points out if you wanted to join the Union, Tennessee was literally 
just a couple miles north of here, and it also shows the division in communities when you have the grave of a Confederate private right over here, Private John Marion Beaver. In the same cemetery, you have another Georgia Union veteran, George Dallas Patterson, who was actually a Cherokee Native American, shockingly still in the local area. And you can see here that he also joined the 10th Tennessee Volunteer Infantry, and he survived up until age 84 to be buried in a cemetery here in Union County, surrounded by other Union veterans, natives to the state of Georgia. And I've heard it said that his Cherokee name was Dallas Black. His father also served and died in 1861. And another volunteer from Georgia, John Jack Voiles, who likewise served in Tennessee. And I'd set out to the Mount Zion Cemetery in Union County to find the grave mainly of Bayless Turner, but I can't actually locate it in the cemetery. I wanted to tell the story about how he was active in the Union in a volunteer Tennessee group, but was killed only days after he came home on leave, kind of demonstrating the brutality of the Confederate partisans in the backcountry because the Battle of Atlanta had already been won by the Union Army, the march to the sea had already begun, and everything was lost. He was just visiting his family home on leave, and they shot him. Here lie the mortal remains of Colonel Benjamin Franklin McCollum, leader of the infamous McCollum Gang. He hailed from a long line of rebels and rogues. Ben's grandfather served in the War of 1812, and his great-grandfather served in the Revolution. The McCollum family seems to have always taken sides in war, and this was no different when the Civil War came along. Ever the rebellious spirit, Benjamin promptly joined the Southland. He would fight as a regular for a year, but was frequently sick, including with a dreaded condition called Camp Fever. His first enlistment expired while he was hospitalized in Virginia. However, seeking to get back to the fight, he rode his own horse all the way from North Georgia to Richmond, Virginia, braving bushwhackers and partisans. This was in August 1862. He probably had a come-to-Jesus moment upon his return to Georgia. Muster rolls from late October list him as AWOL. He had learned that his older brothers, John and George, had been killed, and his younger brother gravely wounded. His uncle and cousin had both died of disease in Tennessee. Things seemed hopeless. Even though he was AWOL, inconclusive records show that he had a semi-official status as a leader of a home guard gang around September 1864. He was actually commissioned by Governor Joseph E. Brown as a captain to sweep through North Georgia, terminating Unionists with extreme prejudice. The South had entered a period late in the war in which war crimes were commonplace and Confederate leaders and politicians looked the opposite direction. They almost certainly knew that Ben McCollum had a bone to pick with Union men. One month later, he was authorized to raise a force of reserves and non-conscripts, basically a civilian cavalry. This was known as the McCollum Gang, and they were ruthless. He was a colonel now, and when an inspector recommended that his unit be mustered out as soon as possible for fighting as a gang, the governor promptly ignored the request. The McCollum Gang usually operated in Cherokee and Pickens counties, and was often said by those in North Georgia to be led by a renegade. When they couldn't find some of Sherman's boys who had wandered too far off the federal road, they'd prey on civilians, often accusing them of supporting the Union before they hanged them. After the war and throughout Reconstruction, McCollum carried this reputation as a young blood. For a while, he practiced law, but his Civil War escapades quickly caught up with him in the early 1870s. The May 24, 1873 edition of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution reports that he was wanted for a time for the murder of a man during the war. The state legislature had stricken this indictment from the record, but a dozen or so men who felt personally slighted by him formed a posse with the intent to take him dead or alive. In a hail of bullets, he slashed the posse leader's throat and narrowly escaped. Several other family feuds and shootouts followed when finally Ben decided to move for his own protection to Henry County, where he continued practicing law. There he made enemies with the town's deputy, who appears to have been protecting a brothel near his law office. In fact, Ben had brought this up to the town council and requested the brothel be removed. The cop began carrying around a loaded double barrel shotgun. On May 26th, a fight broke out between two men outside over the brothel, and McCollum barged out into the street to grab the gun from one of them. The marshal appeared and demanded that McCollum hand him the gun, but McCollum stated that he'd solved the issue himself and would be keeping the pistol as a reward for doing the marshal's job for him. 
McCollum then accused the deputy marshal of being a dirty drunk, to which the cop called him a damned liar. The deputy left to retrieve his shotgun, and when he arrived back, the town had gathered outside and seized the gun from him, demanding he simply return to his home. McCollum, however, was taunting the deputy to the chagrin of his friends who begged him to go home as well. The deputy got control of his own gun and blew a hole in McCollum's chest. He left behind a wife and four children. I'm here at the old Shiloh Methodist Church in Cherokee County to talk some about the McCollum Gang and the brothers who joined this gang. Buried here in front of me is Reverend James McCollum, brother to the leader of the Cherokee Scouts, Colonel Benjamin McCollum. Now, Colonel Benjamin McCollum had been discharged some time before after his enlistment expired and he'd fallen sick. Once recuperated, he took his own horse all the way up to Virginia to volunteer in Phillips Legion. Towards the end of the war, the McCollum brothers, who'd been fighting in various armies, the Army of Tennessee and the Army of Northern Virginia, began returning to North Georgia as their enlistments expired, finding it a radically changed place. Folks had greater union sympathies, and many refused to pay taxes. They could see the writing on the walls. Records around this time become intentionally very vague because they began joining home guard units, which were charged with a sort of mop-up type operation. Intimidation and summary executions were common, and this was all on order from the governor of Georgia at the time, a man named Joseph E. Brown. By the time the Cherokee scouts, led by the Reverend's brother, were truly active, Sherman occupied much of North Georgia and controlled a railroad coming down from Tennessee ferrying in Union troops. Several hundred men in North Georgia had joined a Union volunteer regiment specifically created for the state of Georgia and they were widely hated for only hopping on for the last few months of the war, often thought of as having no loyalty to either side. In fact, Sherman refused to arm these men who were mostly just used to guard the railroads. A myriad of semi-state sanctioned home guard units like the Cherokee Scouts began to look more like gangs. You had, among others, the McCollum Gang, or the Cherokee Scouts, the Johnston Gang, Gatewood's men who would lurk the forests, killing Union sympathizers and beating their families. Another task of the Home Guard was requisitioning supplies for Home Guard men. In this way, the Johnston Gang, with whom McCollum worked, is said to have killed 140 men, women, and children, often families of Confederate soldiers off fighting who felt that they shouldn't pay taxes because they could already not make ends meet. These men, men in the McCollum Gang, men in the Johnston Gang, were widely despised by both proud Southerners and Yankee sympathizers. After the war, many of them went to Texas or Indian Territory or simply dropped off the face of the earth. The Reverend here, however, I'm happy to report, lived very well, was comfortable in his latter years, and was probably horrified by what he saw in the war and tried to put it all behind him. And this was all at the hands of his brother Benjamin. He became a Reverend of the Shiloh Methodist Church, married a local girl named Louisa, and had a baby named Jemima. He died here in the county of his birth at age 72. Father of the McCollum boys, Jesse McCollum, may explain the brutal nature of the Cherokee Scouts and why his sons would come to be seen as a gang and, in some instances, be forced to go into a self-imposed exile. He came from a long line of patriots, his grandfather Daniel literally serving in the Revolutionary War, and his descendants boomed throughout Georgia. They took their father and grandfather's legacy very seriously. Daniel's grandson, Jesse, buried here, the father of the McCollum gang's leaders, married a Cherokee woman named Elizabeth and was distraught at the politics of the day. He saw Cherokee removal as a young man and what happened to his lover's people at the hands of Uncle Sam once the government decided they were politically inconvenient. He also believed, as did most Southerners of the day, that states had a right to make their own decisions on any matter, regardless of what the federal government said. Feeling that Uncle Sam now viewed Southerners the same way they viewed his wife's family, all his sons enlisted at their first possible chance. By the time they made it back, their Cherokee mother Elizabeth had died, and Georgia had changed dramatically. They saw that their work was cut out for them, but that they could enact some vengeance against the federal government that they believe had wronged their parents. This is why I think the Cherokee Scouts earned that moniker, the McCollum Gang.